A beautiful morning to everyone and a very warm welcome to Howe's virtual caravan class on small space living. There will be a 30 minute talk from our presenter who is an expert in small space living. After the 30 minute talk, there will be an additional 30 minutes for questions and answers. The chat will be open at 925 and you will be able to submit your questions for the presenter on the topic of small space living. Once the class presentation ends, there will be an additional 30 minutes for further discussion. So hanging there. Also, for those of you who are on computers, to find the chat, you would hover your mouse over your screen and uh, select chat to send a question to the presenter. And for those of you on devices, iOS or Android, please tap on your screen, select the three small dots, you will see the chat option, click on that, you will be able to submit your questions to the presenter. Here's our presenter for today's class, Sue Ann Carlson, Howe's Executive Director. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia, and a welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm excited to share my uh, tips and tricks for small space living. Uh, and when I think about small space living, I think about all of us that are have our homes on wheels, be it a car, van, or RV. So uh, I, of course, am in a Prius. Uh, and so the focus of my suggestions are going to be based on my experience. So take what works for you and uh, then leave the rest. Um, uh, I've been in a Prius since uh, the end of 2009, uh, and that was part-time. And then I went full-time in a Prius, and this is a Prius hatchback, uh, from the end of 2016 until this very minute. So welcome to my home. Welcome to my studio, uh, my, my 2015 Prius. So I'm going to cover um, kind of three different areas today. One is... Um, uh, what does it, what kind of personality, what kind of person do you need to be to really uh, thrive in a small space? And then number two, um, how do you go about choosing the right small space for you? Uh, what are the kind of the key things uh, that you need to look for uh, in your home on wheels? And then number three, um, what kind of efficiencies can you uh, implement? What are the tips and tricks, I guess, of uh, successfully living in a small space? So we'll start with uh, the kind of person uh, that I am and that perhaps you are, that would be a great personality for a, a small space. What kind of attributes? First of all, a kind of a, an obvious one is you really like small spaces. So uh, I, used to have a teardrop trailer before I entered this lifestyle. And I noticed people reacted two different ways. I have, either they, they were like really excited. Oh, this is so cool. It's kind of like a kid living in a fort. It's so small and, and cozy and, and feels safe. And other people would react and say, oh, that I would feel like I was in a coffin if I were in that. So um, think about how you react to small spaces and uh, how, how small is too small for you. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I noticed that really works for me as a small space dweller is I really like the challenge of living as, uh, in a small space. I like the challenge of finding efficiencies, how to uh, use one thing or one space multiple ways. Um, how can I take up one square foot instead of five square feet to get uh, to do a task? And then last and but very important, the person that lives in a small space, and this is kind of counterintuitive, has to be extremely organized. Um, if it is amazing how easy it is to lose something in a small space. What is that uh, saying? Uh, everything has its place and then everything in its place. That is what I live by. It is not a natural way of being for me, but um, I can tell you if I don't do that, I'm in trouble. For example, 
uh, one year I lost my wallet. Now I knew it was in my car. I tore my car apart, but I lost it for six months. It was well cam camouflaged. Had I put it back into where it actually belonged, I wouldn't have lost it. So uh, enjoy small spaces, enjoy the challenge of figuring out how to be the most efficient, and then uh, be extremely organized. And those are some attributes that uh, living in a small space, uh, thriving in a small space requires, enjoying living in a small space. <clears throat> and then last, um, one of the aha moments that I experienced in 2009 when I was getting ready to actually try the Prius at the time is I realized I needed to think about what I was doing, not as a translation of living in my sticks and bricks and translating that into my vehicle. Rather, I needed to think about it as when I went camping and translated that to my vehicle. So rather than thinking about my vehicle as a house, I think about it more as a tent. In fact, from the very get-go, I've, I've called my Prius my hard-sided tent. So I go camping. I sleep in my tent. I store things in my tent. But I really, really live outside. And that's uh, really the outside is my home. So I say I live out of my Prius. Um, so let's now talk about um, how to think about choosing a vehicle that is just right for you, that is small enough to be considered small living, but large enough to meet what you consider your best fit. So even though this is not about small living, um, I do want to emphasize to get a vehicle, a home on wheels that's dependable mechanically. And if it happens to be our RV, that the RV systems are dependable. Um, nothing, it's really important to have a home that uh, you know will be a safe and secure place for you. So in terms of space, number one priority, I believe, is a comfortable bed. Make sure that no matter how small it is, that you can sleep well. In here in this Prius, my bed is 72 inches long and 24 inches wide at its narrowest. It's not straight up and down, so it's wider in some places. And it is so comfortable. When I was in a sticks and bricks and part-time in the Prius, it was actually my preferred place, my most comfortable place to sleep. So a bed is number one. Uh, number two is to have enough storage. Now, that can be addressed by becoming efficient and implementing some tips and tricks to not need as much storage as, as perhaps you think you need. And we'll go over some of those tips and tricks later, but storage is really necessary. So here in my Prius, I have several places for storage. My passenger front seat is all storage. Directly behind my passenger front seat is storage and then behind the driver's seat all the way at the hatch is storage. So I have three fairly large storage areas. And again, we'll talk about how I utilize those later. Um, another critical, and I would say just as important as the last two that I mentioned, is a place to sit and relax. So that when the weather is, is poor, or if you need to be on the computer and um, uh, out of the glare of the sun, that you can actually sit someplace very, very comfortably and um, play or work or do whatever you need to do in your small space. Then last, I wanna say, and this will be depend, depend on the person and their their particular circumstance and physical condition is, can you stand up? Do you need to stand up to pull on your pants? Um, and for those of you that, uh, that are tall, that might not mean uh, you can do it in a car. I happen to be uh, just uh, under 5'2", 
and I am uh, have a short torso. So believe it or not, I do stand up to put on my pants in the Prius. Uh, it is four feet tall where I, in the area that I sit and lounge, which is directly behind me. And um, that has made all of the difference. Okay, so th those are some things to consider when you choose a vehicle that is small. And, and you ask yourself, is this small vehicle big enough for me? Does it have a comfortable bed? Does it have sufficient storage? Is there a place to sit, relax, and work? And can you stand up if you need to stand up? Okay, so I really want to spend the bulk of our time on some tips and tricks about how to be efficient in a small space. Again, take what works for you. If it doesn't work for you or if it seems odd to you, um, then don't, don't, uh, don't adopt it. But at least maybe uh, some things I'll say will make you think. Um, so you'll hear me say multiple times, choose an item that has multiple uses because if you can do something with one item that typically in your sticks and bricks you do with seven items then you know if it's going to take up less space you'll need less storage so let me give you an example that we all know about and that's our cell phones these are multi-use items so we can take pictures with them we can be on the browsers with them, uh, use them for GPS. We use them as telephones even, and uh, we can text with them. So they are really multi-use items. And believe it or not, I even do some of my work for Homes on Wheels Alliance on my phone. So uh, for me, my phone is truly multi-use and it's an example of, of uh, what I mean by multi-use. Now, um, I'm going to, uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about might surprise some of you, and uh, again, take it or leave it, but uh, consider vodka a multi-use item, substance. So obviously, vodka is, can be used for what it's made for, uh, to drink. I'm not a, a vodka drinker, and the vodka that I use is bottom shelf vodka, so it's, it wouldn't be probably my first choice if I were a vodka drinker. Um, but I use vodka in multiple ways. So I use vodka to clean my body. So the stinky part, so there's alcohol in it, so it takes away the bacteria. Um, I use vodka to clean surfaces. Now, in this particular day and age with the virus, uh, it does not contain enough alcohol uh, that the CTC recommends. So to clean surfaces now, I also use a, the bleach water solution. Typically I wouldn't do that, but uh, right now I am. But usually I wouldn't, it would just be the vodka that has uh, a lesser amount of alcohol and does do some disinfecting. Um, I use vodka as my mouthwash. So right there, I've listed four things, a drink, a mouthwash, a surface cleaner, and a body cleaner. So I've already taken away perhaps four different containers of things. Um, another use of vodka is I will, um, like if I buy something and I take off the price tag and there's some of the gunky stuff underneath, vodka will um, dissolve the gunky stuff. So it's just a, a multi-use item that I keep in a, a small spray bottle and then a, a larger bottle way in the back um, uh, just to, to refill the spray bottle. So that's an example of a multi-use multi uh, substance. How about a multi-use space? So a space uh, that I've talked about is the space directly behind me. It is, uh, the half of my back seat behind the driver's seat. I use that as my lounge area. I also use it uh, as my dressing room. So that is the place that uh, I, I dress. It's the place where I do my sponge baths every day. 
and um, and uh, I use my bed that is to the right of it as my uh, dressing table. If I am using it as a office, the the bed next to it becomes a desk. So that's that one space that essentially the back seat of the Prius is extremely multi-use. It's my bed, it's my lounge area, it's my dressing room, it's where I bathe, it's um, my bucket is stored underneath for bathroom, it's where I use, uh, do my personal hygiene, um, and it is where if I want to just sit and relax and uh, watch a movie, it's where I watch a movie, or it's where I talk on phones with friends, and it is also my sunroom, and I really like the Prius because of all of the windows around. It is um, a joy for me to be inside but still feel connected to the outside. So that space, that one space, fulfills many functions. Okay, so let me talk to you about some of the items that I have that are multi-use or that work really well in, in a small space. And I'm thinking mostly um, ways to reduce the need for storage. Okay, one of the things that I have is a seat back organizer. And it is in that multifunction space I just talked about. So in that seat back organizer are those items that I use most frequently. So a little bottle of hand sanitizer, um, my chapstick, uh, some sunscreen, uh, a bottle of water, uh, some scissors, uh, some utensils. Oh, I didn't mention. Sometimes um, I don't ever have an open flame in the Prius, but sometimes I do cook and I'll make a sandwich. And so that area then becomes a little kitchen. I'll spray it, spread paper towels out and, and fix a sandwich back there. So I do uh, sometimes have utensils, like if I'm gonna have a yogurt or something like that. Um, so that seat back organizer now becomes kind of like um, uh, stuff central. The things that I use every day are in that seat back organizer or I do have a few things on it that have um, kind of personal sentimental uh, value to me. Um, my dog's uh, name tag that she passed away and um, uh, just a, a little flower pin. So I'm, I'm pretty practical, but I do have a, a sentimental side. And so that's where I can look up from my seat and see some things that are important to me. Um, the other piece that um, when I see people move into small vehicles, this is almost something I, I routinely talk about because it's so easy not to do this. Almost all of my containers that hold my clothes, that hold paperwork, that hold my electronics, uh, that hold my medicines, that hold my food, all of the containers are soft sided. So duffel bags are a huge one. Just um, uh, cloth, cloth bags are, are huge for me. And the reason that's important is that when you are in a car or a small space where nothing is square, everything has curves or indentions, you can stuff uh, a bag to form, conform to that, those curves and in, uh, indentions, where if you had something, let's say plastic drawers or a plastic bin, um, they don't conform. So here is the, the gotcha for that. And I'm going to um, kind of tell on myself here. Um, the nice thing about uh, those kind of plastic drawers and plastic bins and all of that is they make things look really neat. So by neat, I mean, uh, you know, 
your disorganization or the appearance of disorganization is um, hidden in the drawer or in the bin, where when you use soft-sided bags, um, it, it, it's not hidden. So when somebody looks into my car, it doesn't look organized, even though it is highly organized. So if this um, solution of using duffel bags and soft-sided bags is something that you want to try, realize that visually it, it doesn't have the appeal of, as uh, bins or drawers. So I'm going to take the camera off here and I'm going to show you my front seat um, and you'll see what I mean. Let's see. So this is my passenger seat on my front seat. You can see I have my notebooks that are used for work and some um, uh, my, my voter paper. That's really the only paper I have. I have an, uh, an iPad there that sometimes I use with uh, my colleagues to communicate. And then everything else is soft-sided. So it kind of looks a mess, but I can tell you, I can find stuff. I know where things are. I know that in that blue bag are all my electronics. In the white bag are the few papers I have uh, for work and personal. And in the big black bag are uh, and some additional electronics. Um, and then my water. Uh, again, all in um, soft-sided bags. And then in the plastic bags are, uh, when I uh, go out to eat, uh, I will keep the napkins. And so in the plastic bag are napkins so that I can reuse those. Um, so duffel bags, uh, really, really, really key. Again, um, you've got to be able to deal with kind of the visual appearance of clutter, even though it's really not, not clutter, I can tell you. Okay, uh, another important tip is uh, that, well, you heard me say, I have very little paper. You saw a couple of small notebooks. Uh, I use that for work and um, making notes. And, and then I have a, a white ba bag of paper and that's pretty much it. Everything else is kept electronically. I came from a sticks and bricks, a home that I owned that had a full basement, a half of an attic, a detached 24 by 40 foot garage with two levels and several outbuildings full of stuff. I had probably 10 boxes, big boxes of photos and photo albums, and then more chotskis uh, than you could count. And uh, the photos, many of the photos, most of the photos were meaningful to me and many of the knickknack kind of things, uh, mementos are, were meaningful for me. Um, essentially, I got that down to a box uh, that was about six inches by four inches by 12 inches when I went full time. And the way I did that is um, I went through, I literally went through everything and took pictures. Um, of things that I wanted to remember and those things that uh, had value uh, either sentimental or monetary I um, gave to people that wanted them and so it was a difficult process but a really 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 important process to move into a small space. Uh, one of the really pleasant surprises about this is that I look at my photos now more than I ever have. I mean, I probably look at my photos, my old photos of my, my ancestors um, now at least twice a year, it, just because I'm scrolling through them, where, you know, when they were in boxes, I, I doubt if I looked at them for a decade at a time. So that was, that was a really, really pleasant surprise. Um, but back, back to um, the need to do that, to live small, um, this, is, this is how I did it, is I took pictures of both things and of, um, of pictures, uh, or excuse me, I scanned, I took pictures of things and scanned my paper photos um, 
for, for remembrances when I wanted to remember those things. And the other thing I do is all, my, all of my um, personal and HALA um, that I do, although I don't do much of HALA's, the list is that. But Excuse certainly, me, Gwen. Yes. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. You no. have five minutes left for your presentation, and the chat is now open for questions from attendees. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your questions. There's, it's hard to get this down to what I'm just going to be telling you in this talking point. So I hope you, you have some really good questions for me. So um, just back to that, I do almost all of my uh, personal uh, bill paying um, and communications on, online. So I have no paperwork. Um, I uh, I do uh, need to keep papers uh, for uh, until something is set up online sometimes. And so I have a, that white bag for that. But um, for the most part, I just try to, to get rid of all the papers. Um, okay, just uh, two more uh, ideas for you before we uh, turn to the questions. Uh, one is that I uh, have learned something uh, over time from people that have expertise that I didn't have. And that is that when you use an inverter that that takes 12 volt and uh, changes it to 110 volt, that, that that's an inefficient electrical process. That it means that it uses electricity in the conversion process. So remember, this is all about efficiency. So I have gotten rid of my inverter and all of my 110 or 120 volt items. And Everything, every electronic device I have now runs on uh, USB cords. So uh, my laptop that you're seeing me on, the camera, my Wi-Fi, um, the iPad, uh, even my toothbrush is now uh, USB cord powered. And that got rid of my 12 volt, uh, excuse me, that got rid of my 10 volt, one 10 volt cords. And all my cords now are, are USB cords. So um, that's just another little tip, both in terms of being efficient with power as well as being efficient with space. And then last, one of my tips for cooking is to get a small pressure cooker or a pressure cooker that would fit uh, you, the need for you individually or uh, your family or a partner that you happen to be um, camping with. A pressure cooker is efficient in terms of its use of fuel. It cooks in a fraction of the time. It can be used like a regular pot, uh, just a regular uh, thing to heat up uh, soup out of a can, for example, that doesn't need to be cooked. Or it can, it's, it can be my uh, tea kettle. I can just heat water with it. And then last, I actually store things in my little pressure cooker. It's just a little two quart pressure cooker. And um, in that, uh, I will. I currently have a coffee mug and a um, steamer. So um, there you go. There are some tips and tricks for you. Um, I do want to say that this uh, presentation will be put on Homes on Wheels Alliance YouTube channel. And in that YouTube channel, in the description, I will have links for you for much of what I talked about, as well as a link to my blog that has some articles on the right side that are how-to articles. So how, why a Prius, um, how to uh, uh, use the restroom, uh, how to cook, those kinds of things. So if you are interested in that, go to our YouTube channel when it's posted. It'll be posted in a couple of days. Um, to rewatch this presentation, and then um, also to uh, check out any of those links. So um, with that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Alicia, are, do you have some questions ready for me yet? I do, Sue Ann. Thank so you. So I will get started with your questions, and I will read your questions in the order that they were received. Thank you. Your first question, Sue Ann, is from... Katie, and she says, how do you handle your toilet needs? 
You know, there's one thing about us, uh, mobile dwellers is that the uh, bathroom seems to be a typical uh, topic. I have a two, two gallon bucket and in that bucket right now, and it is uh, kind of right below me to the back, it's on that hump that is typically in the back seat. Uh, I have a laundry detergent container and I have a 32 ounce um, yogurt container and a roll of toilet paper. And uh, it is, sits in a bucket that's lined with a, what's called, a, a, it's a, a company name is called Double Duty Bags. And they're essentially bags that are made specifically for human waste. And so I'll, I'll talk about uh, urine first. So uh, what I do is I uh, urinate into the 32 ounce yogurt container uh, because it has a, a lid, a large enough opening that I know I'm not going to um, uh, spill out of, I guess. And depending on where I am, if I'm in the back country, uh, I'll save it and then disperse it uh, uh, on some rocks. Or if I'm a place where I'm stealthing or it, that would be an inappropriate thing or there's just no safe way to disperse it, I will put it then in a yogurt container to then take to a public restroom and dispose of the urine. <clears throat> the uh, double duty bags are for uh, uh, number two. And so I have a, a Luggabaloo lid that doesn't fit perfectly on the two, two gallon bucket but it does fit. And um, so I take the double duty bags and the, the reason it's called double duty, double, is there's a, uh, a silver bag that's really heavy. And then within that is a larger black bag that's like a regular um, uh, trash bag. And then there is some, I can't remember what's called, not silicon, maybe it is silicon. It uh, gels when anything, wet hits it. Um, and, and so I call that my backup system. What I do instead is I use a, um, a, a uh, grocery bag and put it over that. So I don't, so it, if you're squeamish and maybe turn your volume down for a little bit. Um, uh, so if the feces are a little bit runny and it leaks out of the grocery bag, my backup with that silicon will uh, sop it up and then I'll, I will uh, take it to the dump and dispose it. If, it, and usually um, it's not runny, I then just take the uh, feces and wrap it up in the grocery bag and um, put it in a smell proof container, which is really important. My smell proof container is a counter canister like you would have in a kitchen that is stainless steel. So uh, no smell uh, uh, escapes it until I'm ready to take it for disposal. Okay, thank That's you. Probably, so much. probably <laughs> enough. <laughs> Your second question come to you from Mark and he's asking, do you transfer on used vodka to unlabeled bottle to avoid open container laws? Um, uh, uh, the answer to your question, do I transfer it to a different bottle to, uh, is yes, but not so much to avoid open container laws. I uh, avoid open container laws by keeping it way in the back, uh, like in a, in a trunk, so it's under my hatch. Um, but I do transfer it to a different bottle because <laughs> the vodka bottle is typically, it's round and then it ha comes up, you know, in a, a, a neck, a, a narrow neck. It's really inefficient use of space. So I put it in a, um, a pre-used juice container of essentially the same size, but it's, it's square. It's a kind of a rectangular shape and it's a much more efficient use of space. So that's a really good example of of uh, the way I try to maximize the space that I have available. Awesome. Similarly, Lark is asking for your suggestion. She said, as I will be traveling with rescued cats, I am concerned about the amount of trash they will generate, litter, 
not so much. I have that down to a science, but all the cans, any suggestions? Well, um, what I do with, with, I'll just tell you what I do with trash. Um, and I generate not very much, really. Um, I use, uh, I recycle the, the grocery bags that I get from the store and I fill them up. And then when I go to the store next, I, uh, put them, uh, in one of the public trash containers. So, um, that's that's what I do. I, I don't have that much garbage, but I think if you had more, I would just take more trips, or uh, take one trip and multiple bags, and then just go around town and find different public uh, trash containers so that you're not just filling up one. Okay, thank you. Karen. Question is: I want to know about how to keep hair clean. I understand clean in body, but what about what product for the hair okay all right so this is a, a another thing that um, might surprise some people um i since let's see probably for 20 years now i haven't used shampoo on my hair i have only used conditioner on my hair and there is a name for it i think it's called co-washing co for conditioner washing and um African American women have been doing this for uh, quite a while, and my hair is such that it's uh, kind of coarse and it works really well. Although my my daughter is the one that told me about it, and she had very fine hair, and it worked great for her. So I only have the one product, and um, so that is a one key. And then the other thing that I do is I rarely wash my hair and my hair, um, my scalp has just gotten used to not producing that much oil. If it gets uh, too stringy for me, I will use cornstarch as a dry shampoo. And essentially what cornstarch does is it sops up the oil, I brush it out and I'm, I'm good. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who told me that he never washes his hair. So I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to try that. So uh, huh. my hair hasn't been washed since uh, February something. Uh, I'm just trying it. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to stay with it, but so far so good. Uh, again, take it or leave it. It's, uh, it's healthy. It uh, doesn't feel dirty, and um, so that's where I am now. I'm always trying uh, new things, seeing if I can be even more efficient. Joanne asks, uh -huh. does your pressure cooker have the little shaker on the top because I have one? Yes, it does. It does. Okay. It's the, just the traditional ones that when this, the pressure builds up, the, the little shaker kind of comes up and... Uh, keeps the pressure at a um, safe level inside of the pot. And Tom wants to know, what power do you use for your pressure cooker? Um, I have a butane stove, just a, a one burner butane stove. Uh, I do that for the simplicity and um, ease. Okay. So iMars wants to know, where do you put your photos after you scan them? Thank you. Okay. So they are in some cloud storage, but um, where I access them are here is here, actually. It's just on my phone. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Margaret says, my challenge are where to store lots of water, also trash, so it doesn't attract animals or bugs. Okay. So um, the trash, I, I typically, if I have a full bag, I will just put it on my, um, uh, in the, the front of my car under, under my window. And that's, it, I don't put, I hardly put anything outside except a chair and my little container that I put my wrapped poop in. Um, uh, so in terms of water, that was a real, real challenge for me. 
And what I ended up deciding on are some um, bladders. They're called water bladders. The ones that I have are MSR, MSR, and they're called camel backs. They are uh, 10 liters, which translates to two and a half gallons. So because they're bladders, again, it's a soft-sided container. It's just another version of a soft-sided container. When they're empty, they take up virtually no space. I have four of them, so I can um, hold. I can have ten gallons of water with me at a time when all four are full. Um, and they, I got them about uh, for three, four four or five years ago, um, and that works really well. And then in addition, I have these containers, and, and they're just uh, water bottles. Uh, I Enough of them for uh, about another gallon of water, and I keep those in the front seat. I have a tendency to dehydrate, so I try to keep them there to, to remind me to keep drinking water so I, I uh, don't have that kind of problem. I apologize in advance for the mispronunciation that's about to happen. Ray Dash Centract asks, are there nomads that serve as mentor for people that want to begin the nomad life? That's a really good question and, um, and something that uh, the HAWA staff have talked about a lot. Um, I would really suggest that um, that you join us at the virtual campfires, at the virtual coffees, um and uh then when the caravans we can get the face-to-face -face caravans going again join the caravans it's not a organized mentoring program in any way but you just you just pick up things you can ask people questions you can find somebody that you really connect with and perhaps then even have a more um uh, uh formal if you will mentoring relationship, although I wouldn't call it formal. It just, you know, somebody that you can just call with questions. So, you know, I have people, if I have questions about 12 volt solar, I, I'll, I'll call them. They're in essence my mentor, but it's not a formal mentoring program. Betty offers you a compliment, loved the tips. Her question is, how do you do laundry? The laundromat, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. I do have friends that live small that uh, that do laundry in their bucket. I could. Uh, there's no reason I couldn't take my two gallon bucket and multi use it and do laundry. But um, I just find it easier to just go to the, uh, the the laundromat. And it is probably one of the things I have two duffel bags of clothes, one for pants and shirts and another for underwear and and um, wash rags and those kinds of things. Um, probably more clothes than I really need, but because I really don't like going to laundromat, I, I just have enough clothes that'll take me at least two weeks. Okay, laundry, Laurie, I'm on laundry. <laughs> Laurie would like to know, what do you use to clean your dishes? Oh, really good question. Guess what? Vodka. <laughs> <laughs> So my, my dish cleaning process is I, uh, when I finish uh, my meal, I wipe everything uh, with whatever uh, paper towel or, or wash rag I've been using so that it appears clean. That means that there's no food particles on it. And it also means that you need to do this soon after cooking so things don't get dried on. And then once it's dried, uh, uh, wiped clean so it appears clean then I spray it with vodka let it sit for a little bit to let the disinfectant take um, take uh, effect and then um, wipe it dry and put it away okay and Heather is expressing a concern for which she's asking your advice how do you deal with glass I tend to use a lot of canning jars for storage but I am concerned with having things flying around in vehicle if in an accident or sudden stops. Right. So I don't use glass. Um, I have used glass in the past, and I can't remember what it was for, but it was necessary that was glass. And I ended up taking socks 
and wrapping the uh, jar in socks, two layers, one going up and one coming down. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And Wilbur asked, Mary, Mary asked, do you depend on cell service for internet when not close to wireless? Uh, yes, I, um, I, when I first started this lifestyle, I would go to Starbucks and McDonald's and, and use their wireless. I don't do that anymore, hardly ever. I really uh, utilize um, cell service for data. And for that reason, I, I need to be where there is cell service. Now, when I'm not working so much, I do allow myself to go to places that don't have cell service. And when that's the case, uh, for emergency purposes, I'll show you this device here. Um, I have what's called a spot messenger device, and it is always with me. This is what it looks like. And uh, what this does is it allows me to press uh, SOS if I ever get in trouble and there's no cell service. This uses the satellite system. So as long as I can see the sky, this will work. Um, so uh, for, for what it's worth, this is another important communication device for me. I've had it since 2009 and I've never used the SOS function on it. So even though it's important to me and I'm gonna keep it and I'm gonna keep paying the service fee, which is now close to $300, even though it started at $100 in 09, um, it has towing with it and it, it, it communicates with people that, I'm, that I wanna let them know every night that I'm okay. So in addition to the SOS service. So this might be something that you wanna consider. And the website is findmespot.com. Tom question is, how do you take a shower? Um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, when I, uh, I will go to uh, rest stops, uh, I'll, I'll sometimes uh, find uh, a, like a pool that has, that I can buy some shower time. If I happen to be uh, near a friend's sticks and bricks, I'll utilize their shower. Um, and the only reason I really take a shower is to wash my hair. I have fairly thick hair, so it's difficult, difficult to do it just with pouring water over it and to get all, all of the conditioner out. Okay, Sue's input is, how long does your butane last? And where can we find more USB items like toothbrush besides internet? Okay, uh, I, I'm all, almost all of my USB items are amazon.com. Um, and so that's where I find, and I just keep searching until I find one and I'll put in the search bar, like when I was, when my, um, when 10 volt toothbrush died, I just did a search USB toothbrush and that's how I found found that toothbrush. Um, what was the other part of the question, Alicia? How long does your butane last? Oh, it depends on how, how much I'm cooking. So um, it, I love to cook. And because I'm so busy now with Hawa, I rarely cook. So my butane, I don't think I've changed my butane bottle for months because I hardly ever cook. Um, I, I am fortunate, I've been fortunate for the last couple months to be with friends who love to cook for me. So that's how I've gotten away with it for the last couple months. But I now eat out a lot if I'm on the road or I just um, uh, eat cold food, essentially. Dee Dee so, would like to know your thoughts on Instapot if it's efficient. I uh, don't have an Instapot. Uh, it is essentially, as I understand, a elect electric uh, pressure cooker. Um, I don't have the electrical power to run an Instapot. And uh, so I, ca I can't speak to it. I'm sorry. And Joanne wants to know, do you ever make a campfire to enjoy in the evening? Do you carry a hatchet? I do carry a hatchet. Uh, I use it multiple ways, surprise, surprise. Uh, I use it mostly as a hammer, believe it or not, than a hatchet. Uh, 
I, for some reason, when I entered this lifestyle in 2009, my fire bug went away. I used to love campfires and, and now I, it, I could, I could take them or leave them. If I'm by myself, I never have a campfire. If I'm with people because of the kind of the primal experience of sitting around a flame with, with, uh, with make my compatriots, um, is, is a wonderful experience. And so I will join others, camp, others campfire, but I rarely have a campfire myself. <laughs> wonderful. Do you use the vodka full strength or diluted? I use it full strength, which, uh, if I remember, uh, I believe it's 60 proof, which would be 30%. Uh, alcohol, so it's not a really strong percentage of alcohol anyway. Okay, and Dee Dee wants to know if 12 volts is doable. 12 volt is doable, I do it. Um, I've been uh, totally 12 volt for at least, well, the last thing I had that was on 110 volt was my toothbrush. And, uh, and that died a couple years ago. And so I've been on 12 volts ever since I've been part-time, which is since 2016. Wonderful. Do you use solar? Tom wants to know. And if so, how many watts? <laughs> um, I don't use solar right now. I uh, depend on the Prius to provide my power. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Prius is essentially a generator on wheels. If uh, if it's just providing power for me, the engine actually kicks on for about five minutes every half an hour, just to keep the high voltage batteries charged. And, um, and so it is a great source of power uh, using very little gas. Before I worked for Hawa, when I, my power needs weren't as great, I had two 14 watt foldable panels. So 28 watts altogether. And I would use those to charge lithium those little lithium brick batteries um and and that was sufficient power for me but again because i'm on uh electric devices a lot now um it the, the two uh the 28 uh watts are just not enough wonderful mm -hmm. and don asked have you seen many van lifers who preserve their own food by canning foods, dehydrating, or preserving foods in their van? I have not personally seen it. I have heard of people dehydrating uh, using the desert sun. Um, and I think I've read of somebody canning. It, it, I, I would wonder how they would uh, effectively store a, a, like a, you know, even a half year's worth of food that was canned. So uh, not, not much, although uh, kind of in, on the periphery, I've heard of it. Okay. Do you have unlimited power in your Prius? Uh, no, <laughs> I have to, uh, I got to put, it's powered by gas. So in that way, it's like a conventional car. And then the gas engine, or, uh, internal combustion engine, will then uh, uh, charge the batteries, which in turn runs the motor. So it is a huge computer and uh, some very smart people programmed it so that it knows how to be very, 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 very efficient in when to use the engine versus the motor uh, versus neither. Sometimes I can uh, coast, for example, and it, the, the car will just make it happen. Gerard is curious, do you use your car heater or AC? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I went from a, uh, 04 Prius uh, when I went full time to a 15 Prius just because some little things like locks and windows stopped working. I gave my 04 to family. And uh, when I got my 15, I splurged and got a, an automatic start. And the reason for the automatic start is so that I could turn it on in the morning when it was really cold 
and warm it for about 15 minutes before I got out of bed. So yes, I do use my heater like that. And um, I'm currently in Pahrump, Nevada, where uh, we I have been in the high 90s. And I, and because I work inside of my car, I have been using um, the AC concurrent with charging my devices when the car is on. Um, again, it comes on for about five minutes every half an hour and then it goes off. Uh, unless it is extremely hot and I have the AC cranked up, then it comes on more often. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I will paraphrase your question for Sue Ann Mary. Mary wants to know if there's any safety tips for women out there alone, uh, just in case of uninvited guests showing up. Yes. The biggest thing I could tell you is you have wheels. You can turn your key and leave. Um, so that's important. Um, the other really, really important piece to that is trust your intuition. If you go into a place and it looks just fine, but just that you get that nagging feeling that mm, this doesn't feel right, trust your intuition. Um, know that you have uh, some uh, innate knowledge that maybe doesn't go through your more a uh, modern part of your brain, but it just innately, you know that something's not safe. Pay attention to that. So okay. those, those would be the two, two big things I would say. Didi wants to know what is essential to convert to all 12 volt? Or all to 12 volt? What is necessary to convert all to 12 volt? Okay, well, um, for me, th that was everything. Uh, and by everything, everything I had that was 110 volt was my electronic devices. So my laptop, my phone, my Wi-Fi, um, and that's pretty much a tablet. That's pretty much it uh, for the things that could run on, on 110 volt. Now, I've recognized that uh, I'm may what satisfies me, what makes me happy and, and puts me in a situation of thriving may not fit for you. So if what you need to thrive is a, um, a what was that called that we were, uh, we were just talking about? A electronic uh, or electric uh, pressure cooker. So if, if you need one of those to thrive, those are not gonna come 12 volt. Um, uh, electric heaters are not gonna come 12 volt. Uh, ACs are not gonna come 12 volt. Uh, microwaves are not gonna come 12 volt. Although I think I have seen, seen one. Um, so it, it, it's a really individual thing. I can just tell you that if you make everything 12, uh, 12 volt or USB based, it's more efficient than if you have both 110 volt and, um, and, and USB based. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Tom asks, is there a need for security being a nomad? Yeah, sure. Um, that's why I carried the, the, my, my spot device. Uh, and that's why I depend on my intuition. To me, those are all security measures. Um, I carry, um, let's see if I have it right here. I carry bear spray, so um, as a possible deterrent. Now, keep in mind, I've never used it, never, ever, but I carry one in my front seat and I carry one in my back seat. So um, I have a, what's called an emergency whistle that is extremely loud. Uh, I know if I'm woken up in the middle of the night and I feel danger, I'll press my key fob to my Prius and an alarm will go off and the lights will flash. So certainly um, there's need for security. Again, I've never in, since 2009, I've never used any of them. So, um, uh, except my intuition. I will say I have turned away from places that didn't feel safe, but in terms of using any defensive tools, I haven't. Um, and I fully believe that being out here in the back country, um, you know, I'm in on the hill, what I call the hill here in Pahrump on BLM land, 
is infinitely more safe than being in town in Pahrump. Just because if somebody has criminal activity in mind, they really have to work to get to me. And I think most criminals are lazy. <laughs> We have one more minute until the top of the house when, and we have several questions left, so we might just be able to get through another one. Okay. Do you, do you feel vodka is more biodegradable than rubbing alcohol or just cheaper? No, I, I think it's not only more, I don't know about biodegradable. I shouldn't speak to that because I haven't studied it, but I do know it's safer. Um, you, uh, if you, rubbing alcohol is poisonous if you drink it. So you're going to, you're going to get really sick. Alcohol is made, uh, vodka is made to drink. So, um, uh, that is, um, there you go. It, it, it just, uh, when I, when I really thought it out, um, it just made total sense because I was using rubbing alcohol to move from rubbing alcohol to vodka. Um, and furthermore, rubbing alcohol leaves a film on things that if you then, touch it or ingest it, uh, you get some of that poison in your system. So after I did that little bit of research, uh, it just made sense to me to go to vodka, even though it, it sounds really odd to folks. Thank you so very much, Swin. We are at the end of uh, the presentation. I will get off and uh, we have several questions we haven't answered. Thank you. <laughs>